It's an hour in Quantum Bible 5. Kind of a lot of stuff coming out of this, huh? Four measly words. But these four measly words end up explaining before the official happening of it down here in 476. These four words explain the split. And is not and is not joined anymore and is not one Rome even see cuz what happened under Constantine and why this this anaphoric center ends up doing the job that it looks like it should do is that Constantine moved Rome east when he did that it ended up provoking and we're seeing how it provoked it. It ended up provoking a split between West and East. That split was already going on a little bit between Western and Eastern Christians starting with Tertullian back up here. Let's see, um, about two, 200 AD. about 112 okay so starting let's say around here around severance around the time of the severance there was a shift between West and East Christianity that started the West became much more institutional and lawyerly okay and the East became much more mystical the shift to Latin had a lot to do with that, and the shift to Latin began in the two, you know, just around the 180s AD or so. Uh, a guy named Carey who wrote a book called The History of Rome, I want to say it's in his penultimate chapter, and I want to say that's like 25, but it's the penultimate chapter, whatever chapter it is. He said that starting toward the end of the sec um, first century, second century, Toward the end of the second century, it would be like the 180s during the time of uh, uh, Commodus. Um, there was no interest in teaching the Greek anymore. And you had to, like, you got it in Latin. And the Latin Vulgate came out in the 200s. That had a lot to do with the split in Christians. And this whole point of... Revelation 17 is as goes the believer so goes history and that's actually been a theme since Genesis okay the song of Moses for example is on that theme which is in what uh, Deuteronomy 32 um, the Christians split and so now Rome's gonna split okay Basically, everything in the Bible is basically saying, Hi, Christian, you seem like you're nobody to yourself and maybe even to the world, but you're somebody to me. That, and the flip side of that is that history goes the way you do. So if you're going against God, so history's going to go, go bad. That's in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. The whole, both the whole chapters are on this theme. Okay, so that's a consistent theme throughout Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, and here it's showing in specific terms historically. If people knew the meter, they would know that. But you see, that's why it's there. That's why this is the theme. Okay, so you as a current Christian are to like learn the lessons of history, and then for your own time, and Revelation 17 doesn't go that far, but Matthew 25 does, for your own time, armed with all this other way that the text is used in the other chapters for the first thousand years, when you come now to our year and you look at Matthew 25, 11, which is covering us, the second Lord in that verse, that's 2017. With all this behind it, because it's, you know, written in the past to tie into Matthew 24, then you know how to read your time. That's the whole point of this. And the theme is always the same. Be salty. Don't be saltless. Well, how can you know what salty and saltless even mean if you don't have a history to back up the words so you know what the Bible is trying to warn you about? 
because Christians are all big politicking today. It's the worst thing they can do. We're coming into a really, really bad period of history. I've already done the videos on that because of the Christians politicking, and that's precisely what Matthew uh, 25, verses 11 and 12 tell us. And verse 12 starts in 2023, future of us. And what I've been doing is showing why that's true by going back to all the chapters that tie to Matthew 24 and the history that they tell. And the history that they tell is about Constantine Christianizing. And the Christianizing of Constantine led to what? Being drunk with the blood of the saints. Not the pagans doing it. Being drunk with the mature testimonies about Jesus because they got they got you know persecuted for that. All right, that's what's bad is politicizing Christianity, and that's the anaphoric center here, starting with Constantine, who was the first guy to do that in the guise of Rome. And so reviving Rome, which is Satan's tactic, is to revive it as a Christianizing nation that polit politicizes its Christianity. And that's exactly what's going on right now in Russia. That's that They're grooming Putin to be the next emperor. That's what the Russian clerics want. Because to them that revives their myth of the last emperor, which is, came out of Constantine's Rome. And the Seven Mountains Christian, calling themselves Seven Mountains, could it be more obvious that it's Revelation 17, calling themselves Seven Mountains, they think the same way of Trump. And sooner or later, they're both going to do that, and if they succeed at it, then it's going to be USSA. And then the, the, the Christians in the U.S. and the Christians in, in Russia are going to fight each other, just like Constantine's kids fought each other. That's where history's going, honey. Right now. That's why I'm spending so much time on this. And I had no idea until Anoni Nominom brought Matthew 24 and said, you know what, this is a timeline. And I didn't believe him. Well, I'm wrong, he's right. And he didn't know enough to, you know, at that point, because he was, he was new to all this, to know why he was right. But I'm trying to explain why he was right. You know. Well, due diligence, call it that. So here's our anaphoric center, starting with Constantine's sons. And at this point, we're at here with Marcion having created the and is not. Because on a religious level, remember I said that it was, you know, with the split with the Latin thing started about here. Split between Latin and Greek in Bible. Therefore, split between Latin Christians and Greek Christians and therefore split in the way they think of God and they worship and all the rest of it with the Latins going more into like legality legalism and the the Greeks going more into mysticism okay and that's pretty much it was already going in that direction but this break with how you read your Bible what language it's in ended up really causing a bigger split and so they were still reading Greek in Constantine's day but Latin was more important. When Constantine therefore moves to the east, it goes back to Greek, where most of the Greek manuscripts were. And so that, that severs the ties between them functionally even more. All right. And finally, with Martian, you have, you have a split with the religion owing to Council of Chalcedon. Now, Council of Chalcedon is regarded as a Latin Christian thing. But it had two, two facets to it, not just one. Yeah, it had the Latin Christian doctrine versus mon monophysitism, which was very popular in the Middle East and in Byzantium. It is a split against that. So you think, oh, well, see, it's going toward Latin, but it wasn't. Okay, the other thing about Council of Chalcedon, that evil Polkaria, of course, was the star of, the whole Mary Theotokos movement is essentially Byzantine more than it is Latin. But the biggest thing about Council of Chalcedon is that it, it asserted the Eastern clerics' right to determine doctrine themselves 
and it's essentially snubbing the Pope of Latin West of Rome Western Rome it's essentially snubbing the Pope from that point forward okay so it's a split in who gets to speak for God. And then you have all these other splits, you know, with Martian not helping the West politically. When the Vandal, you know, the Huns invade and not paying off the Huns, which basically ensures that they'll invade the West. And then he makes nice with the rich. And so now you got this, you, you, and is not. And is not together anymore on religion, on politics, on money, on anything. This is the real split of Rome. Officially, Rome split geographically with Honorius and, um, where is it? With Honorius when he was born and Arcadius. That was a legal split, but these two are brothers under Theodosius I. Okay? They're brothers. But they were dilettantes. All right, so now they're each of the two geographically separated groups have their own advisors and they tend to want to keep their own way. All right, religious wise, there had already been a big separation even by 414, be simply because Constantine moved to Rome. Alright, so this exacerbated the split. But they didn't, Arcadius and Honorius didn't war with each other. Their advisors were fighting with each other. A big rivalry between the advisors of Arcadius and the advisors of Honorius. Okay, because see, the, this is one of the problems. The sack of Rome occurred here in or 410, 410. And Arcadius didn't help much with that. He didn't help his brother much with that. Rung, rung his hands a lot. Some of the royal family moved over to to the east a little bit, you know. But that was about it. Okay, he didn't do much. All right. Well, the the break, the the real like underneath the geography break is here at Council of Chalcedon, where the eastern clerics are saying, "You don't have any authority over us, Pope." And the Pope was so weak at that point, he, ju he just let it go. Marcion orchestrated that, along with Polcaria. And she dies two, just two years later after this. This is 451. She dies in 453. But he was a big actor in that. So and is not, and is not any more connection, except like, you know, lip service, between East and West. And Valentinian is assassinated by one of his advisors, but there's a lot to argue that the Eastern advisors had a hand in that. Because they didn't want, see, the big threat to them in the East was that some guy in the West, Valentinian in particular, was going to finally rise up and be somebody. They didn't want, they didn't want that. Because then that would just, all their stuff that they said in Chalcedon and all the stuff that Martian are doing, th that would be really bad in their eyes. Because then it would look like, well, God is not on the side of the Byzantines. So they didn't cry too much or do anything when Valentini, Valentini III was murdered. And they might have even had a hand in it. Okay. They certainly didn't do anything. Okay? So, historians will tell you, Roman historians, today's, you know, that that's the effective end of the West, not in 476, but right here. So, and is not. That perceptiveness, that precision, that biting, trenchant, incisive statement about history all in these four syllables okay now what you should be getting out of this by now besides the personal point that I left with on the last increment about gee God must really love you that he'd go to all this trouble and then cause you to know the other point about it is that God cares about being accurate 
I mean, it's really hard for people when they look at Bible, especially in translation, and it, it sounds all muddled and syrupy and or weird. And it's like, well, you feel like a fool if you believe in it. Well, do you need to feel like a fool now? Isn't this heartening to know that God will take this much precision, not only to preserve everything so that you can know that's the personal relationship, intimacy, you don't need to feel intimidated by God kind of thing, but also with history particularly. He's paying the same attention to telling you the history rightly as he's paying attention to you personally. So it's not a compromise that he cares for you. Because you, it's going to be real easy to say, oh, well, God cares for me. And then you're either going to be tempted to want to, you know, do something that you shouldn't do. Or you're going to be tempted to think, well, you know, maybe God's not being objective. There's no sacrifice of a punctiliar objectivity here. In other words, it is not a compromise to righteousness or justice that God love you. God loves righteousness and justice. And I don't know if you can see that any more clearly besides the cross than the fact that he's taking so much precision to get just these four syllables exactly right for what was going on in history then, which history he'd have to preserve or you couldn't know that he was getting it exactly right. But now that you do have it preserved and now that you do have it, you do see it, it's like, wow. It took historians years and years and years and years of going through the artifacts and this stuff and that stuff which, by the way, God would have allowed and wanted and even prospered so that that history could be preserved for you. But they didn't know why. It took them years to figure out that, oh, this was the effective end of the West. Not 476 when it officially ended. I mean, you're talking centuries of work by millions of people to get to where I can tell you these, what these four words mean. And they didn't know. They don't know what I'm telling you. They don't know these four words have this significance. Today they don't know. Millions and millions of people who worked on this. They don't know the incisiveness of the stuff. Because they never heard it. They never heard it because somewhere back in the first, second century, we went for the Latin Vulgate. And there, these historians are largely Western trained. So they don't know. And got, I got news for you, the Greek Orthodox don't know, and the Russian Orthodox don't know. And the Jews who should know, since they're the, you know, they're the people to whom God gave this meter in the first place, they don't know. I, I've already done the videos on that. Since the Reformation, at least we can prove it that far back. The West has known that the Hebrew and Greek in the Bible were metered. But every time they went gone to translate it for six well, yeah, it is 600 years or more because they're still talking about it today. For 600 years or more, every time they go to translate it, they don't bother to translate it with the same number of syllables? Kai Uk Astin. And is not is the quickest English translation, but that's three syllables. Okay? Therefore, that's two syllables. Is not. Therefore is not. That's four syllables. Well, Kayax is a therefore. And it is a conclusion. It was. And therefore, because it was, meaning that that's past tense, past imperfect. Therefore is not now. Or, and is not now. Which is a perf well, my preferred translation. Because it's making a play on the break in history between West and East that takes place here. Because that's what it's stressing. The break in history between the two Romes. You got two Romes. And, you know, that, that officially started under Theodosius in 395 when he died, but officially he pronounced it in 393. 
but for all practical purposes they were still dealing with each other on lesser and lesser ways but here when Valentinian dies it's over and is not which took scholars a long time to figure out and a lot of work to preserve the history so they could figure it out and now you know okay so obviously the split you got Christians going against Christian up here you got everybody standing in wonder at it okay she, she, wonder and approving because they hate Christians or wonder and 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 shock and disapproving because they can't believe the Christians will go against Christians and then you got the beast with the you know if you got Christian going against Christian that's like Civil War sort of so now of course you're gonna have jockeying for power amongst here listed as seven heads and ten horns which seven and which ten who cares the point is, is that they're all arguing with each other okay shifting of power dissension civil war you name it all those kinds of jockeying around and as a result the beast that was united is not now these are supposed to be trends of history as well as what's going to officially happen during the official tribulation now fortunately a lot of scholars know that revelation 17 is supposed to be trends of history too that's a big uh teaching in uh, what you might call it the preterists um, and those who are dispies they teach it that way too but not as commonly they're more focused on this is how it's going to be in the future and so they obsess over who are the seven heads and the ten horns forget that get the message in the middle all right so this is a trend of history go brother against brother and then a whole bunch of people marveling at it liking it not liking it and then because it's brother against brother we have all this jockeying for power politically which results in whatever unity there was no longer see it's it's a sequence of history and this particular history is used so that you get a better sense of how what happened so you get a better sense of what these words are talking about. It's paradigmal. All right, and then of course, since you're going brother against brother, and everybody's taking sides, wondering negatively or positively at all the the bloodshed, and and now we've got all this jockeying for position that which was a unity, some kind of semblance of virtue, is not because now there's a split then what is is going to go into destruction and that's exactly where we I said I'd pick up in the next increment but I've taken so much of this increment to do it I think I'll, I'll reserve it and stop now and pick up with Antithemus who's a puppet put there by the Byzantine Emperor who replaces Martian when he dies that's what this is about. So I'll pick that up in the next increment.